talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the Fed, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the fully aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together, we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at FreedomRecords.com. I'm your host, Jennifer Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and we're here today with our very special guest, Dr. Rita Louise. And before we bring her on, let me tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Rita Louise is a best-selling author and the host of Just Energy Radio, and she's the founder of the Institute of Applied Energetics. She is the author of the books, The E.T. Chronicles, Avoiding the Cosmic 2 by 4 Dark Angels, and the Power Within, as well as hundreds of articles that have been published worldwide. She is also the producer of the videos, Icon, Destructing, Destructing the Archetypes of the Ancients, The Truth About the Nephilim, and Deceit, Lies, and Deception, The Reptilian Agenda. Dr. Rita has appeared on radio and television has spoken at conferences covering topics such as health and healing, ghosts, intuition, ancient mysteries, and the paranormal. And I know uh, Dr. Lesson wants to say something before we bring on Dr. Rita Louise, because he's reading the E.T. Chronicles right now. Dr. Lesson, sweetheart, are you there? Yes, yes. Um, so what, what's interesting, uh, it's one of the things that's really interesting to me about the E.T. Chronicles uh, that uh, you've written is that uh, you bring together the sort of uh, uh, iconoclastic uh, regard of the gods of old. Oh, look, those people weren't gods. They were just extraterrestrial. They had their psychic powers together. Yeah, maybe they had good techno, but they were just people like us, you know, they live longer and stuff like that, but they were just people uh, like us, and and so in the their sort of the iconoclastic zeal of, of freeing us from religions based on looking at these uh, uh, humans, very human humans as gods, uh, we've thrown out something, the, the bigger thing that anthropologists have been saying for 40 years is that there's also a concept in every culture and within every person who meditates of, uh, of, of something that's bigger than those level of beings, that, that there's a creator of all or prime creator. And what I like about the E.T. Chronicles is it brings all of this together and, and it just makes uh, a continuous rather than a discontinuous history. So that's what I, that's one of the things I really like about your book, Peter. Thank you, Sasha. That's, you know, you, you put something together, which I'm sure you know, and you put it out there and you just don't know how people are going to take it, you know, or what they're going to walk away with, if they're going to walk away with anything at all. And so I appreciate it from someone like the two of you that have written so many books yourself and have investigated the whole concept of extraterrestrials and ancient aliens. Well, welcome, Dr. Rita. You must be called Dr. Rita Louise, Dr. Louise, Dr. Rita. What, what's our... Uh, Rita or Dr. Rita. Either is fine. Okay. And um, tell our listeners a little bit more about the E.T. Chronicles. That's your latest book, correct? That's my latest book. Um, okay. And so you, you said you put yourself out there. Tell us 
tell the listeners and us how you have done that and what your concerns <laughs> and considerations and well, your feedback and the repercussions. <laughs> Actually, the repercussions have been very few, which has been wonderful. Actually, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive, which is good. Um, when, and I, I wrote this with my co-author, Wayne La Liberty, who has passed since uh, they picked up the contract for the, po- for the book. So when I talk, I might say we, because I don't mm-hmm. want to diss him from this effort. So just bear with me when I say we. Um, but when we first started this project, we were digging into the mythology and looking at this concept of a timeline. And even though both of us believe personally in the concept of extra of ancient aliens and extraterrestrials, he was much more of a contemporary UFO guy. And I'm definitely more of a ancient kind of gal. And, mm-hmm. um, but we didn't want to write the book saying it's extraterrestrials. However, when I started to actually put the manuscript together, once we were done with all our research and we were starting to actually, you know, put pen to paper, there were two things that we figured out that we needed to say up front. One was that the book was being written for the Western world. Because when you go to and talk to Native Americans, if you talk to people in China or India, they already believe that their gods are extraterrestrial. So it would be like speaking to the choir. And the other thing was, was that we needed to just say, this is the basic premise. I tried. Oh, my God. When I because I did the initial draft and he was just, you know, it was his brainstorm. But I was the one behind the keyboard. And I'm trying to write it, and there was no way to tell the story without having that be part of the story because it wouldn't work. There would be no story at all. Right. Wow. Yeah, it's the same story everywhere. (laughs) The whole ancient world had the same story. And that's the part that I find so fascinating. I feel like that is a big piece of the work I'm supposed to be doing, at least at this point in time, is bringing forward these parallels and these commonalities and stories. I mean, because you have E.T. Chronicles, and then there's my new film, Icon, Deconstructing the Archetypes of the Ancients, which is actually newer, um, which looks at parallels in art and artistic style. Uh, and so it's just this continuation of these things that are on Earth that we we can't explain. And the only way it makes sense is if there are extraterrestrials. And there is one other story, but it, it becomes a little more challenging. And, and I, I like giving this guy credit because he and I are so on the same page here. And this is a Dr. Michael Witzel. He is a Harvard professor of Semitic, not Semitic, of Sanskrit literature. Okay, so now how can you argue with a pedigree like that? I mean, he's got lots of letters. <laughs> and, uh, and his theory is the same as mine, except he believes that the stories where we see these commonalities is because they started out with the same mythic literature a hundred thousand years ago and the literature spread around the world with the movement of homo sapiens sapiens sapien around the world and it's a very viable theory except the extraterrestrial one make to me makes more sense in light of what's going on today so he's saying that they they're all common because they have the same writing but don't we, our evidence is more than just the writing. It's the anomalies around the planet. And then we have the oral stories as well. And what other evidence do we have? And it goes deep within each one of us, too, because each one of these gods that we get from the traditions becomes an archetype of our subpersonalities or inner voices. And so it's really interesting to feel that core connection. Mm-hmm. I find it humorous when people say, 
oh, well, the gods are archetypes. And it's like, no, the gods were the gods and they were people, you know, or some kind of being, entity, corporeal, at least could take on corporeal form. And then we created the archetypes from them, but not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's a serious psychotomy. They're, they're both true. They're archetypes, but they're also separate beings. And that's what the confusion is. Because they, as they change through time and they go through different cultures, they get they those different names. Mm-hmm. Is that what you found in your research as well? Oh, very much so. And it seems like in a lot of the cultures, the names that we have for them are actually titles versus they're, you know, not Joe or Bob, you know, but they're the fertility god or, you know, they, they, it's one of the things that is challenging for me. And I don't have an issue saying this on air is like, I'm a little dyslexic. And so saying the names of the gods, you know, if they could just have easy names. But they're so hard. I mean, especially some of those Mesoamerican names. It's like too many syllables. <laughs> right. right. You know, you know, we, we apologize to our Mayan brothers, and we're doing the best we can. But if I, like, totally kill the name, please forgive me. So, okay, anyway. so what are the names that are have a common... They're common well, I mean, just as an example in, you know, just a very simplistic example is in like Greek mythology, we have Gaia, who's the Earth Mother. And in Mesoamerican cosmology, they have Cicloliqua, who is also the Earth Mother. Um, in Sumerian, it's Tiamat. And what's interesting in Sumerian, Tiamat is often represented as a serpent in Mesoamerican cosmology, she's represented as kind of like a crocodile, alligator, but again, mm-hmm. a reptilian character. And Gaia, if you've never noticed, they don't describe what she looks like. We've made our mm-hmm. assumptions. We've given her the appearance of a Venus figure, but we don't have any textual descriptions of what she looked like. So she could have been a reptile. So do you think that they really were in these different forms, or is it just like um, nowadays we have like an eagle represents America, and I was just talking to someone who said that Enki was the um, was the dragon, but he also is now the lion. So it's just kind of like uh, a lot of the, a lot of the, qualities. Uh, Go ahead, honey. A lot of the cultures, they, they uh, believe that the gods could change form. That was part of their uh, structure. They may be reporting what they saw. From what I understand, um, the the commonality, if I pick the common theme, the sky gods, the way I broke them down was that there were the sky gods and the earth gods, and then there were the gods of the underworld, and then there were the gods of building and creation. Um when you start reading the text, they do not all appear white and, you know, tall and white and godlike, how we have that image of God. They take on a lot of different forms. Um, mm-hmm. I think that the fertility gods are always associated with snakes and or some kind of reptile-like form. You know, and they talk about... Uh, you know, because the oral tradition obviously happened a lot earlier than the written or even pictographic description. But the the terminology that comes down is that he was a half man, half snake. And so the imagery we have is the upper body of a man and the bottom part of a serpent. But could it be, and I'm just putting this out as a postulation, could it be that he was what we would think contemporary as a reptilian having a human form, but looking like a reptile, which would make him a half man, half snake. And, and it's possible because they're taking verbal text that has gone through cycles of time and now putting pictures to it. And Mm -hmm. we don't, we don't know. We don't know. Right. Also, 
Oh, okay. I'll, I'll talk first. Also, the snake has been um, associated with DNA, like they were geneticists, as we see the caduceus on the medical symbol. So we have that level of confusion and interpretation, too. Not really. Not really. Mythological evidence supports that it was the fertility gods, like Enki was a fertility god, causal quotal fertility god, and those are the ones that were tied to the actual creation and development of humanity. So it does make sense that DNA would be tied to that serpent character because it came mm -hmm. out of that group. Right, and he's also depicted sometimes with the lower body as a snake, and there's sometimes a tail. And so was it really just a representation that he was a geneticist, or did he actually have that form? Or, or was he just a shapeshifter that could assume that form? Well, it seems like the reptilian, the for, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say reptilian, the fertility gods, so the ones that are associated mm -hmm. with the snakes, did have the capability of shape-shifting. Um, you don't hear that as much from the sky gods. However, you know, there's always that however. Um, Zeus, mm -hmm. you know, the Greek god, often took on different forms. He took on the form of, of a swan. He took on the form of one of the Greek citizens, you know, and the gods were always so good, you know, and he would take on these forms so he could go and have sexual relations with women. It's like, mm -hmm. well, you're abusing your superpowers there, Zeus. Uh, <laughs> right, um, he seduced um, Hera, and then he seduced Hercules. Hercules. It was uh, Hercules and I think Perseus. Mm -hmm. Zeus got around. Yeah. <laughs> Zeus definitely got around. For hundreds of thousands of years. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you think Zeus was um, Marduk, Enki, or Enlil? Or none of the above? I think that Zeus was... All right, I have to... Enlil. Because... Enlil was definitely a sky god. Anki was definitely a fertility god um, because the fertility gods had control of the planet for a very long time until the sky gods came in and took over. And I believe that the Anunnaki, as we know them today, um, were that group, you know, or what the Sumerians call that group. And so Anki, who had had power, lost, lost power and went into a secondary role. Mm -hmm. Is that the story where um, Father Anu came down and uh, they drew straws and then Enlil became the commander and Enki went to South Africa? That would be tied to that, correct. Correct. Right. So who is Anu? What kind of god is he? I mean, I when I put the gods out there, I kind of made five different categories. There is like the all father who is, had come to the planet, but, and P, there are stories that people had interacted with him. So Ra would be parallel to that. Um, but then he was off and watching over people. So I think that's, that's where we got the mythology of God is watching over us is from that character. Um, and then there, you know, I likened it to a corporation where we have the CEO, which was Anu, and then his chief officers. And so uh, the gods of war, the ones that were more the bureaucrats would be like Enlil. Um, the gods of the water, so, and so that would be Zeus. The gods of the water uh, was Enki uh, or like Neptune. Um in Sumerian, I, I didn't really catch who was in charge, or I don't remember, Nutor or whatever, was in charge of the underworld. Um, and then there was another Nigel. part. The gal. See, it's those names. They get me every time. Um, and then there was another group that, depending on the culture, they were either considered gods or not gods. Um, and these were the workers. So in Celtic culture, 
They identify them with the the dwarfs. Um, sometimes they're associated with in Greek mythology as the Cyclops, and but these are the ones that made the amazing weapons, and they're the ones that made the flying machines, and they're always referred to as having some kind of something wrong with them or they're monsters or something to that effect, but they were the master builders. And so depending on the cultures, you have either four groups that are kind of running the show or three groups because that fourth group kind of gets eliminated because you almost get the impression that they're, they're a lesser group, you know, in the totem pole. And so they don't talk about them. Except as you know, these this builder group. So, so are these lesser groups perhaps? Uh, are they full gods? Are they demi gods? Are they are there a caste system? Um, they're Arctic? they're full gods. They're full gods. I mean, they they're not. This was they were in charge long before humanity came into existence, running what was going on on the planet. And were essential in the creation and formation of humanity on the planet. Mm-hmm. So, how far does this go back? Are you going just to the Anunnaki? Or are you going all the way to the creation of of uh, the universe? I haven't read the book, so okay. <laughs> okay, um, where the book starts is, I, I like to say, in the beginning. And so it does touch on, all right, to make it easy to kind of warm people up, um, the book starts with looking at uh, the book of Genesis, you know, like the first seven days of Genesis, and, and making a new interpretation because that was one of our platforms was we don't argue with the mythology. We argue with the interpretation that people have of the Bible, of mythology in general. And I use the Bible to talk about, well, this is what it says. And based on new scientific theory, does it hold up? And it actually holds up surprisingly well with our understanding of like the Big Bang and dark matter and the concept of terraforming, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but where it really, where our story, our chronology begins, I mean, that was just to kind of warm people up. Uh, but where our chronology begins is about 4.5 million, billion, billion years ago, um, just after the formation of the solar system. And this, this piece this little piece is totally speculation on our part, but the facts fit. So we decided to just go out, go with it. Um, and mm-hmm. Carrie or Janet, you'll get this. It's like spirit put mm-hmm. it there for me to write about. And I just Great. said, okay, I'm going with it. Uh, anyway. I knew um, that. Yeah. I knew you'd appreciate it. Um, but We speculated that about 4.5 billion years ago, a group of extraterrestrials, a group of eight, coming in the cosmic egg, uh, came to the solar system. And where a lot of people think they came to Earth first, we believe they actually went to Mars. And we believe they went to Mars and started terraforming the planet. And to make a long story short, things started going wrong. Um, Mars experienced the late heavy bombardment period and the planet was becoming destabilized. And I'm just going to take a bunch of different myths and kind of col- collapse them all into one narrative here. Uh, war okay. broke out between the children. Now, whether they were genetically engineered offspring, whether they were their physical children, we don't know. Um, but between the descendants and inhabitants of the planet and the people in charge, a group they rebelled. We believe that that renegade group came to the Earth about 3.8 billion years ago and started terraforming this planet. And that would have been this fertility god group. And they were in charge for a really, really long time. And it wasn't until, and I don't have a date for when the coup happened, 
uh, when the sky gods came and took over. One question that we were left with was, were the sky gods actually part of the group that were from Mars? Or were the sky gods actually another faction of extraterrestrials that came in and started battling with the inhabitants of the Earth? It was unclear. It was unclear. Mm -hmm. And um, But the sky gods won. The fertility gods got demonized. And they took over. So I feel like that's why when we think of God, God is in the sky. However, depending on where you are in the world and depending on what your culture is, there are still cultures, like if you think in Australia or some very aboriginal cultures that still worship the serpent as being the supreme God. You know, they don't look up to the sky to God. And I believe that that was the original religion. Where that happened, very hard to say. Um, I do feel, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here a little bit, um, I do feel like the presence of the sky gods um, made themselves known prior to 1.5 billion years ago. How much before that, I don't really know. You know, did they come in during the transition from you know, the, the Jurassic and the age of dinosaurs where, which would be a very good fit to a reptilian group and bring about the advent of mammals. Did they come in with the advent of Homo sapien? It's really hard to tell, but I do, I do feel very strongly that they were here in power when, with the advent of Homo sapiens or in and around that time. So 1.5 to 3 million years ago. Huh. Fuck, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Sasha, Dr. Legend, I remember you had a conversation with um, Lloyd Pye the, the year before he crossed, and he covered this. Can you kind of tell us your opinion on that? What Lloyd Pye says is that there's such huge discontinuities in the fossil record that it's, it, it, what's living here is not the result of evolution, but of uh, waves of successive um, terraforming to make this uh, situation exactly what it is. And by the time you get to the Anunnaki, who I've been studying, their, their king, uh, Anu, has, has decided, look, we've been manipulated by the creator of all to uh, create these uh, adapted uh, adaptations of our genome as a slave race, but they're really, we're really their servants. Uh, the creator wants us to foster them and help them evolve. They've got something. They're really far out. Go for it, boys. We want to get it. That's my word. Take care of them. All right. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say something and I could bring her up. Well, basically, you know, we've got this story, and, and there's like stories within stories. So we have the story going through the cosmology of the, of the universe, and it appears to be these punctuated, uh, in, in the art history, punctuated um, periods where we were kind of jump-started and terraformed, and, and then a continual, what do you call it, another influx, of, another change, and so there, there appears to be some kind of intervention coming in periodically and introducing, you know, different species and, and different uh, accelerating the process of evolution, and then you have the Anunnaki came in for to be thousand years ago, and then it really got to another level. But the Anunnaki always had the story of the creator of all and, the, and the species or a being that was above them. So they had their god as well as being gods. Well, and we see that in the archaeological record. I was um, having a conversation. Actually, I was interviewing Dr. Abhid Goswami, and um, we were having this whole conversation about intelligent design. Uh, versus, well, all right, we weren't having a conversation about alien intervention, which is where I would have loved to have go, but that's really not what he talks about. So we were talking about intelligent design, which is an interesting theory. Um, 
But it seems hard to me, thinking back billions of years ago, how we could go from sponges and uh, very simplistic sea creatures and then bam, we got trilobites and bam, we got early fish, you know, just overnight. I mean, just Mm -hmm. the concept of developing the eye. The eye is such a specialized organism. And we went from being eyeless to everybody having eyes. How did that Mm -hmm. happen? And there's not any intermediate species with kind of like sort of bug eyes. I mean, there aren't. And and we see that over and over again happening in the record where there's not any explanation. I mean, the whole concept of warm-blooded animals, where did that come from? We don't know. Somewhere. <laughs> but I don't think pe- people, well, I don't think people think about that. I mean, all right, I think about stuff like that. You guys probably think about stuff like that. But a, a yeah, lot of people that. don't think about how did we make these transitions from one type to the other? I mean, so I, there, I believe that there is a certain oh, yeah. amount of evolution that happens, but I don't think some of the huge transitions we make can be attributed yeah. to evolution. Yeah, what Ty says is that um, microevolution, you know, uh, getting gills or getting a little bigger and smaller uh, happens, but macroevolution is false. There aren't any missing links between the hominoids that were already on the planet, the ancestors of Bigfoot, uh, and, uh, and Homo sapiens, that's us. We were adapted with some of the genes from Homo erectus to adapt us, but we're basically the same as these people from the beer, the big people that dictated history uh, 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 to the Sumerians, the Sumerian gods, and they're the ones that percolated through all the mythologies of the world. Because it wasn't mythology, it was people describing their experience. Exactly. And see, you, you're you mentioning Homo sapiens, and I'm not sure where your 450,000, is that what you said, thousand years ago, day came yeah, from. But, um, yeah. But I'm just going to throw this out and kind of challenge that for a second, um, because... Yeah. The reason that I put the 1.5 million years out there as a date is that there are certain mythic lines that we find that are consistent around the world that don't work unless you push the date back further. I have to tell you, when we wrote this, there there were things that I had to go, okay, well, this is what I'm going to write. I don't know how I feel about it, but this is where the evidence points. And one of those pieces is the use of fire. Around the world, the gods gave humanity fire. And just that one, just that one point, by the time we were Homo sapiens, we had control of fire. We had the use of fire. And so, how do you make well, amends with that? Already here, uh, well, humans have been here. I will wipe out lots and lots of times, but the Anunnaki are latecomers. There were people already here, the ancestors of Bigfoot. Uh, they have, they, they, uh, I went through their bones, they have one bone in their body, they have totally flat feet, uh, they, uh, is like of ours. They're, but they do interbreed with them, and they're still here as Bigfoot's ancestor. And they were seeding too. Each of these uh, great, and after the great disasters, is a receding. Um, this is uh, so obvious, and that we cling to this idea of evolution uh, because people's jobs are dependent on it because their uh, bosses said that's the way it is, and uh, the evidence just not does not support it. it was extraterrestrials, and there was also you know there are. The Nagas of India, they do indeed talk about the uh, snake people that were here preceding uh, the, the, the Homo sapiens that came. And there's a lot of uh, evidence to think uh, that there was contemporary visitation by extraterrestrials, uh, uh, way more than just 
the Homo sapiens uh, like us. There were lots of different races that were visiting the Earth for a long time. You know, millions and millions of years, maybe even a billion years. Oh, well, you know, I give them 3.8 billion myself. I mean, because it <laughs> seems, well, it seems yeah. like there are multiple stories, a lot of stories, that talk about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there there's some, th- the, the ancient god is killed, so in the Sumerian story, Tiamat is killed, and they use her, you know, and this might not be the Tiamat narrative exactly, you know, but they use her hair to make the trees and her blood creates the rivers and her yeah. teeth become the mounds. I mean, that's a very common narrative, which to me oh, oh. sounds like the act of terraforming. But it, it's mm-hmm. actually really, truly uh, what happens with when, you, you know, nowadays uh, we, we think of Earth as having a voice that we listen to. So Tiamat they anthropomorphized, was killed when uh, 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 Nibiru hit her in the belly and she was dead and she was brought back to life and so forth. So they're talking about the consciousness of a, of a, of a real planet. And so it was literally true, too, the way they looked at consciousness uh, as being uh, having an effect upon, a relational effect. You know, I just think it's interesting when you start digging into some of this material, whether it's looking at the archaeology, whether it's looking at the mythology, whether it's looking at uh, religious traditions, whether it's Hinduism or Buddhism or Judaism, but some of some of the oldies but goodies. And there is even in those, in the ritualistic practice, there is a commonality and a parallel and a deep understanding of this connection with God and the Godhood and, and what you need to do to get there. Mm-hmm. You know, that transcends so, time and space. So when they're talking about God, are they talking about a spiritual being or a physical being or depends on the culture? <laughs> well, I think they're talking about a misconstru- misconception of, uh, I'm going to say, a consciousness or energy. Um, mm-hmm. Let's put it this way. All cultures believe in some kind of creator God, whether that's energy or a being or whatever, you know, we're, we're not going to try to define that God, but it is the, the big G that is responsible for everything that we see. And then there's the God that they talk about in myth. And it's interesting because there are a number of uh, cultures in Africa, for example, that recognize the creator God and also recognize that the gods that they talk about in myth aren't the same. So there is recognition in in these cultures that they're it, it's not the same being, you know. Again, you know this, the the dilemma that we have are in the Western world because we're so tied to the Bible, and people mm-hmm. kind of need to step out of that book and maybe open up to other possibilities other interpretations of that same material because what you find in the Bible is actually not that bad in the early parts of Genesis, so to speak, Mm -hmm. all really not that bad. And it is congruent. Everything that you read in there up through the flood and possibly the Tower of Babel is congruent with mythology around the world. Mm -hmm. So So how does these being start getting worshipped and what is worshipping and what is that what's that all about because I don't think this all started out and originally it was you know these stories about these people that came down here and terraformed the planet so they were just beings that had advanced information and advanced technology but suddenly they go from beings that were you know intelligent and advanced to uh, these gods that are kind of uh, 
you know, behind the scenes and and something you get on your hands and knees and you worship and you kill people because of it. Well, yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, it's interesting when you read the stories, and I, I break uh, the narrative into two parts. There is anything that happens prior to the flood, and then there's what happens after. And so prior to the flood, all of the stories you hear are as if it is a scribe sitting in the royal courtroom taking down notes and writing down the story. It is, you know, virtually first person. He's right there. The really bad behavior of many of the gods is not seen as being wrong or bad. Um, and he's part of it. He He's one of the club. He's not separate from the gods. Um, but then after the flood, we start moving into using Greek mythology, the period of the demigods. So you have your Hercules and your Perseus, um, where you have, you know, a half man, half God type character. And it's in that storyline and then moving forward that the, the viewpoint of the writer really changes and it is really written from the viewpoint of us as humans looking at the gods versus where the other stories are the gods talking amongst themselves. And so it's, it's interesting that way. And I feel like, you know, we're really kind of a whiny lot, humans. <laughs> We were just, you know, you, you read um, uh, the Vedas or you read some, you know, of this ritual stuff or these prayers. And it's like, oh, God, you're so good. And, oh, God, you got the best hair. And, oh, God, you got this great car. And since you got all this stuff, you know, maybe you can send me a bushel of wheat. And it's like, I, and that's how they all read is we're. You know, looking up to God and saying all this really good suck up stuff and then come and I want something, you know, and, and it's kind of like we give up our seniority. We give up our own destiny looking for the gods to take care of us. I mean, Sasha, um, I know that in, uh, Zachariah Sitchin's work, or in Michael Tellinger's work in particular, he claims that we're a slave species, which I, I really had um, a hard time finding narrative for that. Not that I'm saying it's not out there, but I wasn't really able to find narrative to totally support that. However, wow. I do believe that we are a very domesticated species. You know, I feel like we have been groomed by the gods. I feel like we are kind of left up to our own, really not able to defend ourselves. We're totally whiny and looking for the gods to come and save us. And okay. any, and even from an evolution yeah. point of view, I think that we show signs of domestication also. You know, physical also, signs. We have a, a real history of slavery in the form of being conscripted into wars of the so-called gods against each other and being used as missile fire uh, people to be killed in their uh, political games. And so that's certainly a form of slavery in my opinion. And it's okay. well documented. <laughs> okay. Yeah. See, and I don't it's like reading thing. war stuff. <laughs> Well, in my perspective, we went from being, like you said, we were part of the family and all of a sudden we're second-class citizens. Well, I don't and think we were ever we're, part of the family. I, I think we're that... We dogs sitting at their feet, and now we're not even dogs sitting at their feet. I mean, I believe that the, many of the stories, you know, all of the stories that we have that are pre, that I call early narrative, pre like flood type narratives are stories that the gods told us and were handed down from the gods about our history. 
which is why we're not in any of the stories unless we're some third class citizen that maybe if we're really lucky, they'll mention our names. Maybe, but not very often. But I, I feel like the one who is documenting it is one of the gods. And then as we're being taught stuff, we're being taught about astronomy and agriculture and that kind of things, they transmit their history to us, which makes which explains why we find the same narratives in basically the same storyline everywhere. So yeah. we basically have it's their story propaganda. That- it's their, it makes so much sense. It makes total sense. That's their propaganda line that justifies their control. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right. And and my brother, my brother, who's a Anunnaki researcher, said to me a long time ago, well, this is what they told us. Imagine what they didn't. You know, this is just what we <laughs> kind of clear those things. <laughs> so we, we, there's no way we can really get the real story. We just get what's been told us because we don't have any human beings writing the story. Or if they did write it, it didn't survive to come through to modern days. You know, everything from the human perspective. Well, and I think it would all be hearsay because humanity, as we know it, really didn't come into the picture until very late in the story. I think there was lots of action happening in and around the Earth long before humanity as we know it, you know, even going back the 1.5 million years or not, um, was around. Mm -hmm. And. It always makes me laugh because when we think of God, you know, in the general sense, in the Judeo-Christian sense of the word, we think of like, he's a nice guy. And if I pray to God, we always want stuff from God. But anyway, you know, because it's a rainy day, you know, he'll make it be sunshine and rainbows and unicorns because that's what God does. But you read these stories and the gods are anything but kind and loving. They're actually cruel and vindictive and conniving and mean for the most part, right. except for Anki. But even he yeah, even has his moments. Be, well, even he keeps us in the lives and does, doesn't give us all the information. But I, that brings a good point. What is prayer? Some people believe that prayer is a kind of focus meditation and that we can create some outcome, but, but it's not going to be a God that does it, it's the power of our own intention. Well, and I think that's one of the things that happened. I think that very early man was able to tap in and use his intuition and tap into these deeper levels of ourselves and the universe and subtle energy and all that good stuff because it's very well documented in cultures around the world. It's very well documented. And it's only later as dogma started getting piled on top and we had these priestly classes that are telling us, you know, you you have to pray through me, you know, for a fee, um, and, and you can get what you need. And I feel like that's when we really lost power, even, you know, or lost more power than we already didn't have. Right, so let's look at that, because something changed politically within the gods uh, and these religions. This is my research, and this is my opinion as well, is that the religions came about as a control system, a, a psychological manipulation system. And, and yes, they started uh, taking, they, they, they started taking humans and, and pitting them against each other, and the poor humans had nothing to do with it. It had something to do with the political situation with the gods. So, you know, let's look at that. What was going on that there was this change? You have a period in history where it seems to go from one type to another? Yeah, and and it's it's not really well documented. So it becomes a lot of looking for supporting evidence. And actually, that's one of the topics that I've been investigating. Just really weird things, weird customs, weird things things that we choose to do, like, you know, uh, elongating the skull. You know, why would we do that? Um, 
ritual sacrifice. Why, why would we do that? And why would it be a tradition that's carried around all over the world? There has to be something to it. There has, you know, what, why did we start in the first place? What was the dynamic that's behind it? And I'm not far enough or I haven't, I haven't meditated on it long enough to pull it together into a cogent thought to communicate per se. Other than we were told that this is what you do. I mean, it seems like with ritual sacrifice, for example, the gods really liked the smell. I'm going to say the smell of burnt organ fat. I don't know what's up with that, but it seems like a consistent thing that was done around the world. Um, you know, so whether there there was... I. I don't know. I mean, then you're like going, well, I have to get into the mind of these extraterrestrials. What's with the burnt organ fat smell? You know, (laughs) I don't know. uh, So so Von Daniken says that when uh, when Kuk Kaklan or uh, uh, Kakas was leaving, he uh, trained 12 uh, young boys to be his priests and uh, taught them everything. But then as uh, their lineage grew, they started using it for political control and more and more and more of their enemies and potential enemies and uh, they subverted uh, all the teachings. <laughs> well, yeah, and so I, I totally that's believe that. And I totally believe that. political repression. I totally believe that. I mean, and that's what I meant by the dogma. You know, there is, you know, there's, and I'm just going to use Jesus, there's Jesus, there's what he said, there's what he was all about, and then there's what the church says, which I don't think are the same. And I think that with these ancient religions, there was the underlying motivation because the, the verbiage is there, the verbiage of how to connect with the godhood, how to connect with the universe is there you know they give us the roadmap but the 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 religion kind of doesn't want us to see it and doesn't want us to go there you know because it gives them the power but um Mm -hmm. you know i do believe the gods gave us that information and i feel like you know people these days are starting to become more aware of it and opening themselves up to having it, accessing it, doing it. Mm-hmm. So that's my hope, at least. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, it seems like it got the uh, propaganda that sort of fine too with the Fifth Tech Medical Council at Nicaea, and, and the, there was somebody definitely in there manipulating this historical. Jesus and the spiritual information for their own agenda. And, and there, I mean, well, that I believe too. The question that I am always left with, which I kind of look at, but there's part of me that just doesn't even want to go here, is, is there that whole extraterrestrial connection? I'm sure you're going to say, of course there is. Um <laughs> <laughs> Of course there is. (laughs) You know, but to me, having to admit that there is this whole grand conspiracy happening and that we as humans, for the most part, are living in the matrix. I I can't think of another way to to state it. um, Uh, Is is scary. Clear. It's so clear to anyone that would listen for just a few minutes about what happened in 1947 when uh, the Nazis had flying discs that defeated our Navy and we got help from extraterrestrials on the exchange program with Serpo that's been made public by the uh, by Kennedy's uh, information uh, group, and it's there in the public record. And so, yes, extraterrestrials have been part of our history since the 40s. <laughs> well, well, yeah. 
it's when you start looking at all these whistleblowers and all this information from the modern all the way through the ancient, it seems to be one inter- an uninterrupted story. And we have like one minute, so let's, and then we'll go to the break. So go ahead, Dr. Rudolph. <laughs> and it just is hard for me to, I don't want to say wrap my mind around it, but to believe that the reality that I was brought up in and you were brought up in and, you know, everybody on this planet was brought up in was a big, fat lie. That's the hard part. The Matrix. It's, it's the Matrix. The Matrix. Right. And, and we will look at that after the break here. But that's, and it is hard to wrap your head around it that every, everybody lies and that everybody's been lying to us since we were born and this is one big fat lie. But we'll look at that. <laughs> Waiting for the music. Um, anything else? We've got like you know, 30 seconds or something. cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. Your body's filling with adrenaline right now. Whether you know it or not. The heart's beating fast. It's giving a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system is telling it to run. But your knees are too weak to move. Fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is mere insanity. Do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. Listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener supported radio. Reporting to danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. Tuesdays at 12 noon Eastern on Studio A to hear Tammy Adams share her knowledge of an unknown realm on Talking With Your Angels. Join Tammy as she uncovers hidden secrets about the spiritual world of angels, ghosts, and other entities that have been with us longer than we know. Tammy is a psychic, a teacher, spiritual coach, a leader in her field, and will be sharing her information and stories with you. So join us on Tuesdays at noon on Studio A. With Tammy's guidance, she'll find out who has been watching over you from the other side, and soon you will be talking with your angels. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. 
Okay, let's try it again. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Sacred Nation on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And I'm your host, Janet Fierre Lesson, with my co host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and we're having a very special discussion with Dr. Rita Louise. But before we get back to our show, I want to remind everybody to go over to the website, to the donation button, and make your donation. Please donate what you can a dollar, five, fifteen, twenty, hundred, whatever you can afford. It's greatly appreciated, and we do appreciate your donation. Your donations allow us to bring you shows like ours and all the other great shows on Revolution Radio. And we do thank you very much for your donation, and thank you for listening. And so we are going back to our show. Dr. Wilson, are you back with us? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. And Dr. Rita, are you there? I am. Okay, so we... We were talking about, um, okay, you said you couldn't get your head around. <laughs> Jared, then, did, you, I don't want to... did you tell people to make your donations to the station? You I did. Never do that. I did. Oh, okay. I did. I okay. guess you weren't listening. So we're back on the show, but we were talking about, uh, where, where did we leave off? Wrapping, wrapping my mind right around the big lie. The big lie. And, and that is, you know, very interesting and the only reason I have my beliefs is because of my life path, and I'm an experiencer, having had interactions with extraterrestrials and, and all that good stuff. And I certainly don't want to prophesize or convince anybody because, you know, I have a different life than you do, and Dr. Legend has a different life than, you know. So how do we do this? Because we're looking at this information, and these are all, to me, these are all theories, you know, all ideas. Well, what makes you trepidatious? What, what makes you uh, uh, realize it's a big thing to say, yes, the evidence points to the ET presence? Well, I mean, I don't negate that extraterrestrials exist. I don't negate that extraterrestrials have come to the Earth and people have experienced them. I don't have an issue with that. Where I start getting uncomfortable is in the level of control they have over the planet. Now, if someone went and pulled the veil away and they showed me, you know, here's this extraterrestrial pulling the strings like the Wizard of Oz, I don't know that I would be shocked. But there is this other piece of me that just says, it can't be true, it can't be true, it can't be true. Because then basically it says everything that we learn, that we have free will, that we're doing what we want. You know, every, it just makes it be a big lie. And how much have we been controlled and manipulated our whole lives? I mean, there already is enough control and manipulation without uh, thinking from an even bigger picture and bigger source. But the more information that comes out, whether it's, the New World Order or Big Brother or extraterrestrials. I mean, I think more and more information is coming out that there are things going on behind the scenes that no one really knows, and it's just a power play um, of what's going on. And I think, you know, people talk about what's on TV, like one of the – I only have Netflix, so we're watching all these shows that are like, you know, 20 years old, and – uh and it's interesting, and we'll watch these shows, and I mean, this has been going on for a while, that talk about these covert things happening, and well, if I do this over here, it's going to cause these people over here to react in this way, and how all of this stuff is being planned out, like it's a giant chessboard, and I mean, it just, there is a lot to take in, and mm -hmm. to me, it seems like, if you say yes to one of them, then you have to say yes to all of them. And I guess I'm not prepared to say yes to all of them yes. yet from I, my personal I, it, experience. Uh -huh. I, I, that makes so much sense to me. I mean, because really, like if you're talking about you have to have disclosure about extraterrestrials and you start to have lots of disclosure, you find out that the world... Uh, Trade Center was a put up deal and all kinds of things which totally would shatter uh, any illusions. And so uh, if, if you don't want your illusions shattered, you, you must avoid this information. 
But it's, it's, the problem is that the intellect is so strong, Rita, that once it gets things, it can't not get it. And I think something's happening. I really think that we're being able to uh, influence the course of things, and it involves uh, 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 the possibility that we've been told nothing but lies, but that we are transcending our masters because uh, we are coming from our hearts and we feel each other and our consciousness reaches out with greater empathy and that's what we've got that's what I think ultimately it makes us a higher species even than our controllers well and I think yeah. that we have the technology in place now that we can look at what they're doing and understand it where a hundred years ago, 5,000 years ago, we didn't have a clue. And so even though we maybe can't reproduce it today, we can at least have a rudimentary understanding of what's being done and how it's being done or whatever. And so I think from a knowledge base, we're becoming more equal mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. Your dilemma, your your psycho emotional dilemma of if you have to take the blue pill, the red pill, and you take the pill that reveals it all, you have to swallow the whole thing. It does. It does shift everything. And I've been looking at that because I deal with people on that personal level, and we do um, counseling, you know, psychotherapy as well as talking to experiencers and interviewing whistleblowers. But you know, looking at it, we got over, you know, we get over. Um, Santa Claus, we get over our, you know, our hurt and our pain. If we can move past it and up level all the pieces for everybody, because with this disclosure, we have all these, you know, cures for diseases and new technologies for green, green, healthy climate, you know, technologies. So there's a, a big upside to it if we can just get our heads around it and embrace it. Excuse me. Um, you know, recently, you know, like there are a lot of people that uh, believe that the World Trade Centers, for example, was a, a U.S. government job. It was a false flag event, which absolutely I don't have an issue wrapping my mind around that concept. You know, looking at the tape, looking at the repercussions of what happened because of it and the amount of control that the government got over the people of the United States from that one event because the government totally benefited out of that event. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's taking it to the next level saying, well, but it's extraterrestrials controlling it. Well, you know what I mean? It's like, anyway, let's just move along. But even when you look at anything that's going on anymore, at least for me, like, um, a few weeks ago, and I, I don't recall the exact details, but I think it was a congressman from Florida was saying, um, he was saying that actually 9-11 was done in conjunction with Saudi Arabia and that there were records, like 28 pages of records that were being held back and weren't being released because it would it reveal Saudi Arabia's involvement in financing the whole 9-11 thing. You know, because the United States wasn't going to take any responsibility, but Saudi Arabia could take the heat. And I'm reading this article and all that's going on in my mind is what's going on between our and our relations with Saudi Arabia, because now we're putting this dirt out on Saudi Arabia to give us an excuse to maybe go in and do something to them or create some kind of sanctions or embargo. And it's like, it's not fun to sit there in this whole guessing game of what's going on. I mean, it's bad enough. We don't know if it's going to be sunny the next day, much less what kind of craziness is going on in the government and the world around us that we are so not privy to? We need transparency. We uh, need to be able to have the information. We need to let our bright uh, lights shine upon all the information it can get. Exactly, but it seems like there isn't any, and there hasn't been for a very long time, unfortunately. Well, uh, there's something that happens uh, on, on social networks that allows people to share information really fast. 
And when you have an idea that counts for data more efficiently and comes to conclusions that can be checked, like uh, there are extraterrestrials, like there's a covert government that runs things and, and makes false flag events, and that they are being controlled by extraterrestrials, you can say, okay, if that's the case, what information would prove it and what information would disprove it? And uh, uh, it, it, you, you, you can see that it's a neat hypothesis and it works that there are extraterrestrials on top of the matrix that controls us. And I, it does work. And maybe that's the scary part is it does work. And I don't like thinking about it. <laughs> so I think I'll just stay in the matrix and have my steak and glass of wine like that one guy and, and call it good because I don't know that I want to be eating oatmeal mush every day. Well, I think that's really wise. Just, just dig, dig what you've got. Don't sweat what you've not. You're alive today, so this is your dance. Do it. <laughs> Part of it, you know what? Uh, you know, anyway, uh, where do you want to go? I know you have a lot of things you want to cover. We've got about forty-five minutes, and um, so you don't want to go into that too much because it hurts your brain, it hurts your head, and it's hard to get around. Your it. latest anyway, and hottest. What? 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 Like what, what uh, really turns you on right now? Well, I mean, yeah. the latest thing it had, that I put out has been my movie, Icon Deconstructing the Archetypes of the Ancients. So we've been primarily talking about my book, E.T. Chronicles, What Myth and Legend Tells Us About Human Origin. So that's a book. And then the other one is this movie, uh, which is a documentary that um, has actually been getting fantastic reviews. I mean... You write a book and you put it out there and that's bad. And then you put together a movie and you put it out there and that's even scarier than doing the book. Um, right. And so, but it's been getting great reviews. Um, one of my personal favorite review has been, it's like ancient aliens, but more scholarly. I'm like, oh, how wow. awesome is that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tell us about the movie. What, uh, and so what the movie talks about is iconography and artistic style. And so iconography is the study of the subject matter of a piece of art. It ta it's about the characters that are in a piece or the scene that is being represented in a piece of art. Um, and one of the things about iconography is that there are subtle meanings or visual cues associated yeah. with it. Um, you know, and they tell a story. So, for example, and I'm going to use religious iconic art because it's been around the longest. Um, even though today people are starting to lose the meaning. But anyway, um, so, for example... Excuse me, uh, St. Peter, who was, you know, one of the 12 uh, apostles, is usually represented in a piece of art holding a set of keys. And so if you're looking at pictures of, you know, from the Sixteen Chapel or any of that, you know, religious type art, and you see this guy and he's holding a set of keys, that would be St. Peter. Uh, another example would be Moses. Um, many times he's shown where having a little set of horns on the top of his head, um, or he's holding the Ten Commandments. And so when you see those characteristics, immediately you're going to think of Moses. You know, and then in a different example, Hercules, um, even though we don't really resonate with Greek art, all that much anymore, but Hercules is always represented with a club and a, a lion skin. You know, either he's wearing it or he's carrying it, but there are always those two elements in images of him. And so when you see a piece of art and you see those elements, you can tell who that person is based on their attributes. And so that's mm -hmm. iconography. And then artistic style is about how something looks. So, for example, 
I think everyone listening, if I make the comment, well, can you imagine something that is a piece of art that's from Egypt? You know, and I think all of us can imagine, you know, the guys with the sideways, you know, face going to the side, but their body <laughs> faces forward, and then their feet turn back the other way, or hieroglyphs or something. But I think we all have an image, or if we saw a piece of Egyptian art, we would not even worry or wonder. We would be like, oh, that's Egyptian art. I don't think there's anyone that could not recognize it. They might not who not know who's in the picture. You know, they might not know the iconography of what's in the image, but they'll recognize the style. Oh, that's Egyptian. Um, versus something like modern art. You know, you, you think of uh, Picasso and he's got those people and they're all kind of broke up and their eyes are over here and their Lego is over there in the picture and they're just kind of bizarre. Um, we, we definitely can recognize that as modern art, you know, or Salvador Dali. I mean, some of these modern artists where you look at the piece and go, okay, it looks like a blue canvas. Okay, but what is it? Well, it's a study in blue. It's like, oh, modern art. <laughs> no, we can get that. And we can tell the difference between Egyptian art and modern art pretty easy. And the same thing goes for architecture. You know, there's art artistic style and there's architectural style. So I think if you put a picture of a Victorian house in front of someone, most people would go recognize it as a Victorian house or at least have an idea of when it was built versus if you put... Um, a Gothic cathedral, um, you know, something that was done hundreds of years ago with the big spires and the points and the cement, they would recognize, you know, well, okay, that's way older. Or a, a piece of Chinese um, architecture, you know, and it has those little turned up corners, which I don't know why they do that, but, you know, but it, it's it's characteristic Chinese. And so if you see something that has those little turned up corners, I think most people would recognize that that's a piece of Chinese architecture, regardless of where you are. And so what I did was I was looking at different pieces of art and different pieces of architecture and, and more like uh, megalithic type pieces and comparing and contrasting these pieces together. And I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. It becomes a little challenging because it's it's the video. The subject I was covering really lent itself to video because there is it's image based, you know, and it mm -hmm. goes into things like uh, different Venus of Vindeldorf's and it goes into, you know, just talking about here's this piece of art. So, for example, oh, see, you guys will love this one. You'll love this yes. one. Okay. Well, you know, you guys are the, the Sumerian people, so you'll love this one. Okay. So cool. in South America, um, in Peru, it comes out of Peruvian art, they have a little water deity, a little fertility deity. And it's this guy with this just kind of like square head, and he kind of is floating. At least that's how they usually represent him. And coming off, all right, I'm going to say this slow for you, Sasha. Coming off of his shoulders are like three little fountains. Now, uh, who would it make you think of if you were to think of any other artistic style? Some guy with these little water fountain things coming off of his shoulders. Oh, it's a picture of Anki, uh, as far as the sea. Yeah. Right. And this is the kind of thing this movie goes into is so in Sumerian art this is a representation of Enki and you know one of his right. his iconography is you can recognize him because he has those three little water things with the little fish coming off of his shoulder and he's yeah. associated with fertility and he's associated with water that's that's Enki's story but when he you go humanity fishing he <laughs> and it was a big one. <laughs> but in South America, they just have this generic 
fertility water god that they represent over and over again. But when you look mm-hmm. at him from an iconography, iconic perspective, to me, what they're representing is Enki. But they've lost the mm-hmm. name. They've lost the name. Right. And so, are you finding that this way? We we we've actually had a friend that was doing this, and I'm glad you're doing it in the movie. But he was able to track down all the different gods all the way from the beginning of the story, all the way through you know more modern times. So mm-hmm. that's the way of tracking it down by their symbols. Like, what are they carrying, or what do they have on their head? What, what kind of exactly? They? Exactly. You know, and that is an aspect of iconography. Um, another one is in India, we have Indra and he carries the Vahara, which is, uh, well, now it's a symbol of peace, but in the day, um, it was a lightning weapon. And mm-hmm. we find representations both visually, like picture, pic, picture, picture, Oh, you know, sometimes I try to say words that just will not come out of my mouth. <laughs> Pictures of them uh-huh. that that um, transcend. So, for example, like the Bahara, it, I'm just, see, this is where the pictures come in so much better because you can see the picture and you totally get it. Um, but it's a shaft, and on the shaft are these prongs that are bent in and kind of make a, like a little ball or sphere and on the end, on each end. But early in history, it is supposed that those spikes were actually opened. And there are representations, even in contemporary time, of the Vihar with the open spike when it was the weapon versus the symbol of peace with it closed. And you look at that image, and it looks just like the weapon that Mardu carries. Exactly. Exactly. And mm-hmm. then you look in Greek art, and Zeus carries a weapon almost identical. And you start looking around right. the world for this thunder god, lightning god, and they all carry, you know, this Vihara-like weapon. Or in Indian cosmology, it is sometimes referred to as a club. And so you start looking at cultures that carry clubs, and we have Thor. He's a thunder god. He's related right. to the sky, you know, and so he has a club, but sometimes it's an axe. And see, this is where and I... you're a coach, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But I see, but this is like it's starting to spread around the world. And where I always get so excited, where I always get so excited, is when I can find parallels in Australia. Because that tells me I've hit a nut. Because the stuff that comes out of Australia has not been touched in thousands of years. And so that's oh. always my, that's always my, if I can find a parallel in Australia, it's good. And we have one. And please excuse if there's any Australian listeners listening. I, I don't say their names right. <laughs> I was on a radio show that was it, aired in Australia and I told this story. And the comments were, well, if she's going to say our God's name, she can at least pronounce him right. It's like, <laughs> Sorry, I don't have the phonics monitor here, okay? Uh, but there right. are the Wakari brothers, and they were these lizard men. See? Gotta love it. And uh-huh. they, their uncle, uh, Kadili, was trying to have relations with the women on Earth. And they used wow. their weapon... The Woomerang, a.k.a. Boomerang, and castrated him. And then he went into a watering hole. And so you take that narrative and you find so many pieces that tie. Um, for mm. example, for example, Kronos, fertility god, associated with the lizard people, um, castrated his father with a sickle. Take that one wow. step further... We have Thor, the thunder god, who has a weapon that once thrown, it will come back to the hand of the user. You know, actually, we have several people that have a weapon that once thrown will come back to the hand of the user, just like the boomerang. 
And so mm-hmm. we find these very subtle parallels all around the world, whether it's a verbal representation, a pictorial representation. Like Australia, we have very little pictor- pictographic illustrations, or at least they have not been uncovered. I'll say that. They mm-hmm. have not been uncovered. Uh, but verbal you know, descriptions of these different things, and if you start taking them and weighing the merit, you know, and it's not just, oh, because it was had to do with lightning. You find that there are sometimes two, three, or more pieces that tie together, or two or three pieces tie here, but then this one ties over here, and then this one ties to this one in a, you know, in a very weird and bizarre way. So, um, when, when I was, when I, when I work, sometimes I feel like a a slot machine, you know, and I'll be thinking about this stuff and I'm like thinking about all these myths and moving them around and doing this and doing this. And it's like, you know, I'm waiting for the wheels to come around and go seven, seven, seven. Uh, (laughs) so I can just put it to rest, but I'll just, you know, go around because I know there's a connection and it's just a matter of moving the pieces to just the right places that you right. can find the pattern. And apparently I really right. like yeah. that, you know? Yeah. Say that again. That's how it works. The more information you get, uh, the more it, you, it, your brain sorts it out and you know that something's coming. If I got you, you just know that a lot, some bigger picture is, is starting to form for you. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it's okay. uh, interesting and a little overwhelming, uh, maybe a little sleepless, <laughs> but uh, but it's all good. It's all good, and especially that day that it's like, oh, and you have that giant light bulb moment. Right. <laughs> so, so where's it all going? Where's it all going? Well, I think as more and more material comes forward, that we're going to have a bigger and better understanding of where we came from. You know, I'm often asked, well, why do we need to know? And that's a pretty good question, and I don't ever have, like, a really good answer, um, unless it is as the two of you contend that there is this whole extraterrestrial thing going on in the background, then it becomes extremely relevant what our history is or what we can glean of our history. One of the things that I have found by looking at all of these different cultural groups is this culture has this piece of the story and this culture has this little spin on a story and this culture has a different spin because the dogma, the propaganda, the changing over time, maybe they kept this detail in while these people dropped it. And these people, you know, just wrote it from a different perspective. And you start combining all of that together, you can get a much bigger and broader understanding mm-hmm. of what the real story is. Or maybe the real story is. Possibly, hopefully, um, whether we'll ever know what the truth is. I mean, I could see where the extraterrestrials would maybe come down and confirm or clarify at some point in time, but it's still going to come through their filters. And so what the real truth is, I don't know. You know, there's always two to- two sides or more to any story. <laughs> Yes, so how are we going to get the real truth? That's the question. But, but yeah, ultimately the purpose of this stuff is, you know, we're we're learning and growing, and I think somehow our subconscious mind takes all this information and processes it to a higher level of order, and it, it, it improves our lives. I mean, the more we know, the better decisions we can make. Well, and I think with so much... Um so many pieces out there and so much that you have to consider 
it makes you, I mean, it's kind of like my slot machine. It really makes you have to juggle a lot of data, um, whether it's about the extraterrestrial uh, question, whether it's ancient astronauts, whether it's political, whether it's, you know, and you have to take this massive amount of data and juggle it and manipulate it within your own psyche, which can't help but not create new neural networks, you know, and so maybe all of this stuff is coming up and this is just coming through me. So I'm just putting it out there. Uh, maybe this is all coming up because that is part of our evolution is to think about this stuff and it will help us create the, the muscle, the, the, you know, the brain muscle to move us forward intellectually. Mm -hmm. Oh, I concur. I totally agree with what you're saying. It's like when we become aware of the archetypes that are within us, the little subpersonalities that are all uh, are trying to express themselves with their own vested programs, the more we can center ourselves and not be imprisoned unconsciously by adapting any of our programs, but to come from our own hearts and feel each other and feel this planet mm -hmm. and to not be unduly uh, organized by propaganda because that's what we've been getting from every other uh, direction except our own hearts. Well, and I think the propaganda wagon is wearing so thin. And I, I don't... I mean, okay, and I'm sure this is the same for you. You know, I don't hang around in crowds that watch TV and believe what they say. You know, and I, so it's a little hard for me to judge, but I think even in the mainstream population, there are more and more people that watch what is being presented on the news and watch what's being put out there and are beginning to question it. They might not be doing anything, but I don't, think they believe what the government is telling them or believe what different institutions are telling them and realize that there's something afoot going on. Oh, most people, most people have seen uh, enough to convince them that there are unidentified flying objects. Mm -hmm. and, and they've heard from people, reliable people enough to know that there are contacts. Some of them are pleasant. Some of them are unpleasant and abductions, and then our own military has a clandestine uh, space program with anti-graph craft. I mean, everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. And I think that for the general public at this point in time, um, all right, if they were nice extraterrestrials and if they landed on their your, their front lawn, I don't think people would freak out. I mean, they might freak out till they figured out that they were nice. I think if they had a, a negative experience, Although I was talking to someone the other day and they said, well, you know, people, the extraterrestrials aren't negative. It's just that people's reaction to them is negative. And so the experience they have is a negative experience because they're afraid, which makes sense to me if the extraterrestrials are all really nice, which I don't really know personally. Um, but I, I could understand where if someone was taken onto a ship and they were doing some procedures or whatever where they would perceive it as a very negative experience just because they were scared. I, I can understand that. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Are, are they um, operating the same way we are? Are they good and evil, light and dark? Or since they come from a higher level of awareness, are they just, you know, doing things and we're perceiving it as good and Evil, light, and dark. Yeah. I don't know. Come on, Janet. You're the experiencer. You're supposed to know all this. <laughs> There's more I have than my one opinion. <laughs> I have my opinion. For me, I've had, you know, great experiences, but that's because I did a lot of therapy on it and I integrated it and I had also meditated mm -hmm. on it and contemplated it. And, and then over the years, my, my subconscious has unraveled what was really going on, you know, because whenever you have something like that, you revisit it over and over and over again until you get some kind of, uh, you know, revelation on what was going on. And for me, it was all positive contact. And then from a logic perspective, it's like someone that's at it, they don't think that they would be 
evil or, or, or dark. I think that they would be connected to source and, and to higher awareness if they would have great empathy and compassion. So well, and I think that opinion. if they were here to do something evil to us, they would have done it already. That too, yes. So, so but like I here. said... You know, I think if an extraterrestrial, you know, if a UFO landed on just about anybody's lawn, okay, but I do live in Texas and they do have guns, so. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't think that the reaction would be, I mean, I think there would be trepidation, you know, to know whether they were going to be nice or not, but I don't think people would have a heart attack or not go, holy crap, a UFO just landed on my front lawn, you know. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, there would be a cognizance where, you know, in the 20s, you know, people wouldn't, they wouldn't even know what it was, more than likely. Where now, everybody would be like, hey, a UFO landed on my yard, in my yard. And they already do. They land at the uh, air bases all the time, and everybody local knows it. But it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> the government's pretending that everybody doesn't know, but everybody already knows. Mm-hmm. Well, I think Which... I have a point there. I was just watching a YouTube that shows a, a current uh, sighting. It's a large, uh, very large ball that went up and down and moved in erratic ways, and it was definitely in, uh, some kind of craft at some point. And the people were just going, oh, look at that. They weren't running or scared or, you know, hiding and all freaked out. They were just, matter of fact, looking at it, putting out, getting out their cameras and filming it. Mm-hmm. I think we have a whole different culture than we did in the 20s, where people would be have no concept. Or after the war, the world's um, what was that guy's name that did the world awards, uh, more of the worlds from the what was his name? Come on, name that too. Anyway, when he did his show, and everybody freaked out and thought it was you know mm-hmm. uh, some kind of invasion. So we're a brave past that now with this awareness. But you know, so since the down, 60s, we're ready. <laughs> Since the 60s, there have been so many things in perception that have changed for the positive. Um, Our understanding and cognizance of extraterrestrial phenomena, UFOs, stuff like that. The whole idea about psychic abilities, I mean, that has changed so much. And I think... uh, there are a lot of young parents that are raising their children with consciousness and yes. are being open to allowing their child to have intuition and express it or their past lives or whatever, you know, that happens to be. But it took a whole generation. I mean, like my kids were brought up that it was okay to have a psychic experience. I mean, you know. They're my stepkids, and when I first moved in with their dad, they were in, like, grade school, and they'd go on the computers and go, this is my stepmom's webpage. She's a psychic. And it's just like, oh, God. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was great. And uh, But they were brought up around it. You know, one of them would go around and go, what's that ghost doing in the hallway? You know, and it was just very natural for them. And so I would expect that when they raise their children, that it will be okay as well, because it was okay for them. You know, so, and I I feel like that's changed, you know, the whole concept toward like gays and uh, lesbians. I mean, there's been so much change in our perception about people and acceptance and, and ghosts and, and everything that, uh, it's kind of amazing. It is really kind oh, yeah. of amazing. Well, it's like when you look past your, back in your own lifetime, and, and I'm 61 years old, and I look back at how things were back in the 50s, and if I were to time travel back to the 50s, I'd probably be way out of place <laughs> because of all of what I know. I would look at time out as a very primitive society that was ignorant and so imagine uh, an extraterrestrial with their perspective, looking at an enemy and the things we think and we do. So perhaps all of this, like Gene Run, very Star Trek, and all the movies and all the you know things that have been happening since, especially Roswell, were here to prepare us for something greater. 
Well, and it okay. just makes me wonder if, you know, what we see in the movies and on TV um, isn't being put out there and approved so that there's a certain amount of getting us used to certain ideas and opening the door possibilities so that when they do dump it on us finally and tell us, oh, there are extraterrestrials, and we go, duh. You know, I've been watching them on TV for years. Um that it's not so shocking. I mean, the whole same thing with ghosts. I mean, uh, you would talk about the ghosts. Pope will say, the Pope will say he, had, he already converted them already. The, you, the aliens? The, yeah. So, you know, it's like the, you're, you're getting ready for disclosure at the Vatican. And the question is, will Mr. Putin or Obama or the Pope announce it first? <laughs> <laughs> Well, my feeling is if that an extraterrestrial landed on the White House lawn, that not very many, there would not be, it would be a very short list of people that I would want to do the first contact with them. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want any of our like regular leaders to go, you know, I'm thinking the Dalai Lama, he'd be good. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. or, you know, or just a really short list of people. You know, if Maya Angelou was still here, she'd be okay. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> um, but to send some of these other clowns in there, poof, they would just, you know, they would just leave like that. Kind of like that cheese commercial, immature, you know, we'll come back uh -huh. in, in a while. We'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> so, would, so would you like to be the ambassador to meet with the extraterrestrials? You know, they, they appointed somebody in the... Um, United Nations as the ambassador to meet the extraterrestrials. And Dr. Reed Reed, would you like to volunteer if we had any control over this to be one of them? I wouldn't have an issue. I like talking to people. I can be <laughs> compassionate and I can see both sides, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I know they had a problem with the guards. You know, there's a whole reality shift when you actually have contact with extraterrestrials and the guards that used to you know, monitoring the halls in the early days when the ETs were starting to walk, you know, among the, the military, they would drop over gates sometimes and we'd have a heart attack. So there might be some uh, kind of preparation we need to do in order to be in their energy. What do you think about that? Either well, people. I mean, even stories that come out of mythology, um, you know, like it was said that if you looked upon the face of Zeus, you would die. Or we have mm -hmm. Moses going and going up to the top of Mount Sinai and he could not look upon the face of God, you know. And so I think there is either something that they look a certain way that doesn't look like us that would kind of freak people out. Um, or there is something to their continents that would be challenging. Now, I am very sensitive to energy. And so... That could either be a good thing or a not good thing, uh, depending on how what their vibe is like. You know, if they got good energy, I'm good. If they got bad energy, eh, maybe not so good, because I wouldn't like it. Do you think, do you think that may have been something to do with the environment they were in? Maybe they breathe a little bit different air, or maybe they have, um, you know, some other requirements to be in their presence. What, what are your thoughts, Slash? What do you think on that, too? What is that about? Do they have higher radiation or something? It could be a radiation. It could be having something to do with radiation or some kind of protection. Or some I mean, kind I think of, they uh, had apparatus. some kind. I think they had some kind of an immunity issue, and that's uh -huh. why when it came to dealing with humanity, they always wanted a separation. You know, it might have been they were just prejudiced. You know, because we were the black-headed people. You know, we're over there um, that they just didn't want to intera interact with us. But it seems like they always wanted to be sequestered. And so whether it's um, a visual thing, whether it was, you know, because they got this thing about ritual purity. You know, if you're going to go and be around a God, you have to, like, take a bunch of baths and you have to be ritually pure. And there's this whole long list of things you have to do before you can be in the presence of God. So whether that's being to a certain internal energetic level, which is possible, 
uh, or whether there's something on the physical plane that's an issue. I guess we'll, well find we were, out. Yeah. Well, our, our we, study we were is showing that the Anunnaki made babies with every successive generation of girls. Right. But the, we were we were um, interviewing somebody about intelligence, and they, they thought that one of the ways that they saw God was that they took some uh, certain herbs and and pages, um, that helped them to, you know, bridge the dimensions and see God. And, so like and, ayahuasca you know, or something? Yourself. Ayahuasca, yeah, if you don't prepare yourself in that fashion, then you would have an adverse reaction and could die. So that's one of the theories that we heard recently. Well, I mean, you know, the use of psychotropic drugs have been used for millennium. I mean, it's not yeah. a new thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you guys read Carlos Castaneda books, you know, that were very popular in the 60s and 70s. And How are you? He, what did you say, Sasha? I was at UCLA with me in graduate school. Oh, and, you know, the whole thing. First... What about UCLA, honey? Carlos Castaneda. He was one of Goldschmidt's uh, star students. And you met him at the UCLA? Yeah. Okay. okay you know, you. but his whole first his whole first book is all about drugs, you know, and that's what turned yeah. people on to him is because he's using a bunch of drugs to transcend, and then he yeah. realizes that he doesn't need to use the drugs in order to feel the energy and interact with the energy, and so I think that you know the drugs are just a tool to open yourself up and not necessarily the only way to create that uh -huh. experience. Uh -huh. Right. It just teaches you the, the way, the path, but once you get it, you don't have to do it all the time. Right. And I, and I don't think you could. So maybe that's what the priesthood was about, because, you know, the gods, uh, there's there another faction, another factor, is that at one point the gods uh, uh, wounded Imana and uh, almost killed her at the Battle of Troy. The gods were actually fighting side by side with their their people, their humans, and then the gods started getting wounded, so they, they built their ziggurats, and they made um, this whole ritual before you could come before them. That was another factor, or another story. Have you heard anything similar to that? Uh, anything? Not that, I mean, where I kind of dropped out in the whole narrative, where where I start losing my interest is where humanity kind of comes into the picture. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I like really old stuff. I mean, I have a uh, undeclared minor in art history. And once you got to Greek art, I was so bored. And that was, they really didn't teach anything, any Sumerian art, other than like, this is a ziggurat of her. That's it. Um, that was about it. Um and so most of my training has been in indigenous art and, you know, certain other periods of art. But my fascination has always been, you know, the older, the better, you know, or the more indigenous, the better. Because to me, that's source, you know, that's closer to mm -hmm. source and probably has less dogma tied to it because they're going to try to stay with the original tradition. I mean, they're in the original uh environment and so if they haven't progressed into making bows and arrows then why would we make the assumption that their religion and culture would have progressed either interesting okay we have about uh ten no, oh. nine more minutes or so any what do we want to cover go ahead sash i'll just say it's it's interesting to me that when you look at things like uh, Angkor Wat, you see that uh, they had um, chemically bonded cement that they just melted a stone into molten form and poured it into molds. And so that very often, you know, there's megalithic uh, architecture, many story buildings and so forth, that precedes the hunters and gatherers that came later. So it's, it's really worth looking at depth, 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 and of course it's harder to get stuff the older you get, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing how things keep getting pushed back earlier. There's been so many waves of 
uh, civilization and near extinction uh, events that have happened on this planet. Mm-hmm. Well, and I always find it very interesting that the further you go back in certain cultures, the more sophisticated, the more complicated the art, yeah. the architecture becomes. I w- I'm thinking about doing, my, you know, my new thing is doing these videos. And so I was thinking about doing something on um, death masks. I haven't quite decided, but I was thinking about doing about the whole concept of death masks you know, to kind of add into mm-hmm. my research on these traditions that we've had at some point in time or another. And what always floors me is when you look at death masks that come out of Mesoamerica, you see the ones that are the Olmecs, which are the oldest culture in Mexico, the Mexico area. Um, uh-huh. And they are exquisite. I mean, you look at them, and they are yeah. phenomenal. They're cut out of one piece of jade, and they're beautiful. I mean, they're thousands of years old, and they're beautiful. And then you look at stuff that came from the Maya or came from the Aztecs, and they're they're hideous. I mean, the facial features are hideous. They're made of, like, these tiles of jade. I mean... Not even close. The the workmanship is not even close. You find the same thing in Peru, like in the Saxuaman area, Cusco. You know, you find that kind of construction. And but then when you find that same cyclopedian construction somewhere else at a, a later date, the quality and workmanship is far inferior. And so there was something going on back then that we've lost it. We've totally lost it. And we don't we, we don't have the answers. We don't have the key. We don't have the library anymore. Just like Saint Peter having the keys. I think hundreds of people today could look at a picture of Saint Peter and go, Well who's that? And not recognize that that's who it is. Where a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, it would he would be very recognizable because he was in our library of recognition. Right. Who's the one carrying the oak? Have you researched who's carrying the oak? Maybe that's okay. There's actually, I think there's multiple people that carry the oak, but no, I have not researched it. Egyptian art is a little complicated. Egyptian cosmology Mm -hmm. is a little complicated because... It changed hands so many times, and it's become really kind of distorted. Mm. Sad to say. What? Everything gets distorted over time, it seems. Well, it changes. No, hands, and and both. I agree, but you know, I, but there have been so many like major changes as far as like who the deities are, and it's just as complicated. And I haven't. I'll admit it, I have not sat down and spent the time sorting through it. And I know it could be sorted through. I just haven't. It's not my mission in life at this time. (laughs) It's somebody else's mission. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And hopefully they'll do a good job. And then I can borrow their work. (laughs) Well, wouldn't that be great if we had more people on this research? Then we could have a better picture of it. You know, that's what it seems like all these researchers are out here are all about by themselves, and they don't have this uh, concerted effort. And we, you know, if we did it like the uh, Illuminati did it, we'd have to figure it out by now. So, yeah. All right, we have like five minutes. What do we want to cover? You have a lot. Well, of I, I just want to mention. Shows. I just want to mention to your listeners, I mean, uh, the E.T. Chronicles deconstruct or E.T. Chronicles, what myth and legend has to say about humanity is available on Amazon in both book and Kindle format. Um, they can get it off my webpage, soulhealer.com, where it will always come autographed. Um, yeah, that's priceless at no extra charge. <sighs> Um, 
and then the all right, but this is this is the big one. Okay, so icon deconstructing the archetypes of the ancient, which was likened to uh, ancient aliens, but most more scholarly, is available on Amazon Digital Download. Get this one for a dollar ninety nine. Now you can't wow. buy oh. cheaper than that. A dollar. I mean, that's for the rental. But dollar ninety nine, you can purchase the digital download for like nine ninety nine. Or if you want to get the box case DVD, you can get that off of my webpage, soulhealer dot com. But a dollar ninety nine. What a bargain. Dollar ninety nine. Can't beat that. <laughs> you can't beat that. <laughs> well tell me a little bit more about your other books you had written. Just briefly, because we have about three minutes. Sure. Um, and so um, my book prior to that was uh, Dark Angels, an insider's guide to ghost spirits and attached entities. And that's pretty much what it's about, ghost spirits and attached entities. Um, I've worked as part of a ghost hunting team for about five years. And so I talk about um, different types of ghosts you might experience in people's homes. Um, mm -hmm. I talk about attached entities. I've had a lot of people, excuse me, come to my practice. I am a practicing medical intuitive and intuitive counselor and have had hundreds of people come to me that have entity attachments and I help them to clear them and resolve them. So I tell a lot of information of working with them for years, um, what they are, et cetera, et cetera. I talk about extraterrestrial. See, that's a whole interesting concept, the, the difference between ghosts and extraterrestrials or the gods and extraterrestrials, but we don't have enough time. Anyway. Um, oh, I was, um, just a little aside real quick here. I grew up in a haunted house, and I would love for someone to come over and investigate the house that I grew up in, which our family acquired in 1901, I think it was. My sister still has it. But it's the 1840 farmhouse uh, from in, in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh. And uh, there were all these uh, extraterrestrial interdimensionals. I, I didn't know how to distinguish one from the other. Very good point. When I was a child, I just called them all ghosts. But as I got older, I went, well, maybe some of those were actually extraterrestrials or interdimensionals. So that would be a whole other show. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you tell the difference and all that stuff? Excellent. Okay, continue. Okay, yeah, and, and then uh, my other two books, Avoiding the Cosmic 2x4 and The Power We're In, are about health and healing, energy medicine, and understanding why we get sick from a spiritual perspective. See? That was All available on soulhealer.com or Amazon or wherever. Well, why do we get sick? Why we get sick. <laughs> Yeah, because we're we're, we're cuckoo. <laughs> we're cuckoo. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> cuckoo factor. <laughs> and uh, your website and everything. Soulhealer.com. www.soulhealer.com. All right. I think we did. Thank you. Yay. Thank hey, you. Yay. Thank you, everybody. Like for hanging out. Oh, ho! Oh.